My name is Deonda Johnson. I'm interviewing Mr. Glenn Miller at his home near Bidwell, Ohio on August 10th, 2007 for the African American Presence in the Ohio River Valley Oral History Project. Um, Mr. Miller, can you please, oh, one more thing before we start. If whenever I ask you a question, you just answer in a complete sentence. So if I say, what is your name? My name is, because my voice is going to be cut out of the mm -hmm. um, tape. Um, Mr. Miller, can you please state your full name and spell it for us? My name is uh, Glenn Miller, uh, G-L-E, two N's. Uh, my middle name is, I uh, won't give you that, but my middle initials are, and uh, uh, my last name is Miller. Glenn R. Miller, that's who I go by. I don't, uh, I don't like my middle name. I don't like it too well, so I don't use it. I was actually uh, named after my father. My father's name was, uh, and this will probably give you a hint of what my middle name is, his name was Rudolph Odell. And uh, of course they called him Doc. At, and a lot of people never really ever knew what his name was because that's what he's called, and I was named after him. So, yeah, uh, I'm usually just known by Glenn R. Mm -hmm. Now, how, why was he called Doc? That was a name that he had from his childhood up. I don't know why they, I don't know why they had the name. It's what everybody always knew him by, and that's what he always went by. I just like my mother. My mother's name was Sylvia, Sylvia Elizabeth, and uh, her uh, 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 nickname was Charlie. Uh, nobody really ever knew what her name was. She always went by Charlie. They always, always thought maybe her name was Charlotte, but her name was actually Sylvia. But uh, from her childhood up, I think her, one of her uncles was named Charlie, Charlie Cordell. I think that may be where she got her name from. But, you know, it's just uh, names, nicknames more or less sometimes stick more than your actual name does. Um, what was your mother's maiden name? Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit about your parents, where were they were born, when they were born? Mm -hmm. My dad was born uh, in, on the Lambert lands, as uh, your interview is going to hopefully uh, talk about in a little bit, and he was born in 1903, March of 26. My mother uh, was born down in the lower part of Gallia County in a little place called Patrick, Ohio. Uh, they were, uh, she was born in a, in a white community. Uh, in fact, uh, all the probably know that all the other cemeteries in, well, in Gallia County and all the state of Ohio and all of the United States of America up until a certain time were segregated cemeteries. Well, on her side, her family is buried in the white cemetery. All of her, my grandparents and her brothers and her sisters. Also on my mother's side, which was the Jackson side, there was 22 in that family. They had, uh, I think they had three or four sets of twins. Now, a lot of them, not them on her side of the family were, were dead before she was ever born. They weren't all in the house at the same time, but uh, it was quite a big, quite a big family. Um, how did your um, mother's family get to that part of Ohio? Do you know how they came to reside in that small town? Well, <laughs> rumor, rumor has it. Now, I don't know, and I've never really researched that part of it. But uh, uh, down in, uh, in Patrick, uh, my, my grandmother, uh, uh, supposedly come here with the Carter, and it was Carter Plantations out of Virginia. Whether it's the same Carters, I don't know, but they were intertwined with, with that family. So I, I kind of think that that might have been how they got here. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, now, what is your date and place of birth? I was born in 1940, April 28th. And where were you born? I was born on Lambert lands, born in a log cabin, one room log cabin. and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't remember anything about it, and I don't remember ever living on the Lambert land, but uh, we, Daddy, uh, he moved around a lot, worked for different people, and uh, and after I was born, well, he moved, and we moved down into where my mother came from. He lived down there for a while, and then he moved back up here, and then we bought a place in a little village of Porter, and that's where, in 1942, so uh, that's where I grew up. Um, what year were you born? Again? 1940. Oh, okay. Um, do you know if you were born at home or in a hospital? Home, where there wasn't no such thing. Had a midwife, and the midwife always said, she'd always tell me, uh, you know, I caught you. <laughs> and uh, her name was Romy, uh, Romy Harrington. And uh, Romy Harrington, she was off of the, the Millers. That in my ancestry, as uh, you probably talk about a little bit later on, uh, and uh, there were three brothers that come out of that, and uh, Rome. Harrington come off of one of the brothers' side. So they, everybody was just more or less related in the community. Mm -hmm. 
Now you talked about your father moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. What kind of work did he do? Farm. Daddy was a farmer in, 20, in the younger years, but after uh, he got older and we moved and got settled in Porter, he he more or less did uh, uh, what was to call sawmill work. He worked on a sawmill the biggest part of his rest of his life. But now, farm was the biggest basic uh, wage that he had. Now in Porter, what type of community was Porter that you grew up in? Type meaning? Was it integrated, segregated? It was integrated. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, they were, uh, oh, they were probably four or five black families and the rest of the community was white. And how big was the community? At that probably when I grew up, Porter probably had uh, 75 to 80 people in it. So mm -hmm. it was a small community. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, what was the major industry that people worked in around Porter? Farm, farm. Uh -huh. um, Just to go back a little bit, what do you? What is your family's ethnic or racial background? Well, black and Indian, I guess, and uh, a little bit of everything else sprinkled in, I guess you might say. <laughs> um, what race or ethnicity do you identify with personally? Black. Um, you talked a little bit about your parents, but now just to go back and talk about your grandparents. Who mm -hmm. were your father's parents? My father's parents? My, my father's father's name was uh, uh, John Oliver, John Oliver Miller. Uh, well, I, you want me to give them all to you? Yes. Okay, I, it's easier for me if I start at the, the bottom and come up. My, my, I'm five generations from, from Bedford County, Virginia. My uh, great, great, great grandfather, five generations back, his name was Isham, and uh, he come from Bedford County, Virginia. He had three sons, uh, uh, William, Wyatt, and Powell. I come from the, the uh, Powell side of the family. Uh, and from Wyatt's uh, son, he had a, uh, his son that come from my side was, was John Oliver, John Oliver Miller, then my father, which was Rudolph uh, Odell, and then to me, okay? And how about your father's mother? What was her name? Her maiden name was Evans. Now there was another black community uh, between uh, Porter and, uh, uh, well, we'll say Galpless. Uh, it was called Buck Ridge. Uh, she, her maiden, maiden name was Evans, and she come out of that community. There was different pockets and settlements of black people in this area that, uh, uh, that uh, I assume that, you know, came out of slavery. And, and, they, and it used to be a lot of black owned uh, property in this area. Of course, now, as we know, it's all gone. But uh, at one time, there was several hundred acres that was black owned in different communities and pockets of Gaggy County. Can you name some of those communities or pockets? Yeah, uh, well, like I said, we come out of what we called Morgan, which is what you've known as Lambert Land. Uh, down where my grandmother come from, she come from a place that was called Buck Ridge. Uh, down the other way, there was another community, uh, what it was called Campaign. It was Campaign Creek. It's this Campaign Creek sits right behind us and it was called Campaign. All of these little different communities they moved into, all of them had their own churches and, and what have you. Uh, Bidwell, as uh, uh, Porter was the, the underground uh, railroad site, Bidwell was not as old as Porter. It really didn't come into existence till a railroad come through. But uh, there's another community in Bidwell and that's where the church was in this area. But uh, then on up in Venton, there was another settlement up there where the Howes lived. Over in Salem Center, there was another pocket of, of uh, blacks over there. And the reason that the church was built in, 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 in my father's uh, community, which we call Morgan, it was built in between Salem Center and Morgan, where the two communities come together and made up a church. The church up there was actually uh, 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 originated around 1845. Mm -hmm. And um, can you do you know how the church got started or who started the church at Morgan Bethel? Well, not not really. I don't know who started, but like uh, my wife has already said, there was other people that were already in their area and uh, the, the Powells and the, uh, the uh, Jameses. And, uh, and like I said, there was another uh, set of Evanses that come from over uh, in Salem Center and they all come together and verge there at that time. So I'd say it was just a community uh, thing that started. Also at Morgan Bethel, where Morgan Bethel sits now, uh, they also had a school. The first school sat right across from where the, where the church was. Then later on, after the community got more uh, populated and more set up, they built another school that's set up in uh, the Lambert lands. Uh -huh. And what was the name of that school? Do you know? 
just, I don't know what the actual name was, just Morgan, I guess that's what they call it. Uh, really, everything around here goes by Morgan. This is Morgan Township. Uh, the the uh, town, uh, town uh, house is over back of us, and everything here is usually just called Morgan. So I'd say it was just a Morgan colored school is probably what it, what it, probably what it was called. Um, do you know when your grandparents, your father's parents were born? <laughs> Not without looking it up in, in my in my book, I've got it all down, but not right off the top of my head. No, I don't know that. How about your mother's parents? Mm -hmm. um, can you please tell me their names and where they were born? My grandfather's name, or my mother's father's name was was Andrew Andrew Jackson, and his wife's name was uh, 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 Catherine, and she her maiden name was Evans. Uh -huh. And wh where were they born? I don't really know that much about that side of the family. I'd like to research it sometime, and I don't really know where to start. Some says they come from out of North Carolina, some out of Virginia. I don't know really. We've never really got to that part of it. I'd, I'd love to do that and love to find out, you know, just exactly what that part plays in that. But I do know that the community they come from was, was a lot different than the communities that were in this area. They were more uh, integrated than what they were up here. Well, on my mother's side, as I told you before, there was 22 of them. Those are, she had 21. My, my grandmother. Oh, okay. Are you talking about my mother? Yeah, your mother. My mother, my mother. My mother only had two, uh, me and my sister. My sister's 11 years older than I am. Uh, she had other children, but they were uh, uh, lost in childbirth. But there's 11 years different between me and my sister, and we only had two in my family. I guess that's one reason that we, as far as feeding the family, we never had it as hard as some of the rest of them did because our family was small. Um, when was your sister? You said she was born 11 years before uh -huh. you? She was born in 1928 uh, or 29. She just had a birthday the 1st of August, so she don't like to tell people that. But <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Can you please tell me your wife's name? My wife's name is Corliss, Corliss Marie, and her maiden name is Borden. And... Um, when was she born? She was born July the 7th, 1943. Four. Four. <laughs> you gave her a year. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. um, and where was she born? She was born in a little community uh, 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 which sits between Porter and uh, 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 Galplis of Evergreen. Uh, it's just a little bump in the road, as you might say. Uh, um, and how did you meet your wife? Well, she, her mind's not as good as mine, but, <laughs> but I, I, I think we always knew one another. Of course, I was four years older than she was. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I think where we, we really, I really remember her uh, is we were swimming in, in Raccoon Creek. And that's where we, in the country, that's where we went. And instead of going to pools, we had different creeks. Raccoon is a creek, it's just as clear as a crystal, and it runs for 99 miles into the Ohio River. And uh, one day we were swimming over there, and for some unknown reason, she made up in her mind that uh, I was the man for her. And after that, it just uh, accelerated from that. She had, her story's probably different, but that's the truth. <laughs> and um, how long did you guys date before you got married? Oh, probably a year, year and a half. Uh -huh. So how did you ask her to marry you? Well, that's enough. She asked me. I was awful quiet and shy. <laughs> so how did she ask you? <laughs> no, I just, I just said that. No, <laughs> no, we, uh, I don't know. It's just uh, something that uh, we just felt that uh, it was something that we did. And really, you know, it, especially uh, living in a rural area, uh, as you said, everything, if you wanted to meet a girl, you went to the church or, or some other uh, function. And uh, there really wasn't that many uh, to choose from. But uh, some way or another, it all worked out by divine intervention that you got the right person at, uh, for the right time, you know. And um, when you guys dated, where, what kind of places would you take her? What kind of activities would you do? <laughs> well, it wasn't too much of that either. Uh, uh, I remember when uh, uh, I took her to her prom, we went to, uh, uh, after the prom was over, we went to Bob Evans' restaurant. And uh, like all the rest of them, drove around the restaurant, you know, with all the cars and all the boys and girls and things like that. And, and then we'd go to, uh, at a drive-in movie that we'd go to. But other than that, there wasn't really too much going on. And of course, there were 
Uh, not in our day and time, but it was something similar to the times that the older people had. They used to have what they used to call suppers, where they'd come together and have parties. Well, when we come along, the teenagers would have, you know, little parties and things that they'd go to and play music and dance and things of that nature. But really, as far as going out into society and socializing, as far as uh, more or less towns and cities and places like that did, we didn't, we didn't have that. Um, when did you guys get married? We got married... Uh, September the 30 days has the 30th September 1961. Uh, and where did you get married? We got married at the at the, uh, the pastor's house. Uh, we went down to his house. In fact, uh, his name was Reverend C. M. Payne, and he had uh, uh, was the pastor of Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Bidwell. And by that time, he had retired from pastoring, and he was. Uh, uh, pastor emeritus, and we were the last couple that he married before he died, and uh, we got married at his house. Mm -hmm. And do you remember what you guys wore? Well, it wasn't a suit. <laughs> I'll tell everybody, we only had one suit in Porter, and I got that when I graduated. And another good friend of mine, which was white, when he got married, he borrowed my suit to marry his wife. So really that uh, our official dress in, in Porter uh, a porter is, is, is distinct from Bidwell. We were as much different as daylight and dark. Uh, kids in Bidwell, they were more uh, society oriented, I guess you might say. But in Porter, our official dress was blue jeans and t-shirts. And, uh, and like I said, we, nobody owned a suit. In fact, if you come out of the house with a suit on, they would have probably hung you, I believe. It's just, just that way that we were, you know, the way we were raised. Talk a little bit about your schooling. Where did you attend school? I started the school at a, a, a two-room uh, colored school. I started school in 1946. Uh, first uh, one through third uh, grades was in one room, taught by uh, Miss Bernice Borden. And then when you left there, you went over this right next door, and the building was hooked together into the fourth and the fifth grade, or the fourth, fifth, and the sixth grade. And that was taught by Miss Beulah Johnson at that time, or Miss Beulah Anderson, I reckon, at that time. And uh, uh, when you were there, then uh, for someone, well, I know the reason that they did, but then you went into the, uh, oriented into the uh, public school system at seven through, or junior high and on into high school. Mm -hmm. So you and your wife went to the same colored school mm -hmm, in Bidwell mm -hmm, then? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How far was the school from your home? Well, as I said, uh, we lived in Porter. Uh, the school was in Bidwell. Uh, where we lived, I walked to school. I probably could have rode a bus, but it's just something that everybody in Porter did, so we walked. I never did really think too much about uh, being uh, segregated in a one-room colored school because black and whites walked to school. We walked past the white school, which was at Bidwell Elementary, uh, and our school was on below that. They stopped and went to school at uh, at uh, at the Bidwell, and we went on down to the colored school. Come back, and we'd get together, and we'd walk back to Porter. And I don't know, we never ever thought about it. It's just uh, just the way that things were. You never question. You just read, just come. That's just the way it was done. You know, you never thought about uh, being segregated or set apart or uh, Jim Crow or equal or anything like that. It's just uh, just the way it was. You just took it for granted that that's the way it was, and you never really thought about it. Now, do you remember any racial incidents happening happening when you were younger in the town, in the area? Uh, that, how young? Like, just growing up. Do you oh, remember? well, like I said, not really, because, you know, we all played and together in, in uh, you know, and, uh, we were, uh, another thing that was distinct about, uh, distinct about Porter and Bidwell, Bidwell had all the girls. Where I grew up in Porter, at other, of course, my sister was 11 years older than I was, and uh, of all of the, there was all boys in Porter. There wasn't a girl growing up in my age in Porter. So we'd get together and we'd have what you call a war. We'd have a war with Bidwell because they had all the girls and you know, and that's, but uh, that was just a difference. And, and I don't remember any, uh, any really racial things that really happened, uh, you know, growing up at that time in the 40s and the 50s that uh, before desegregation come, it, uh, you knew your place and what your, what it was and things like that. But as children growing up, we all played together and, and uh, went to school together and, and did everything together as, uh, as kids will, you know. 
fact, we didn't really realize that there was any difference. You know how children are. They don't really uh, see color until they get to the point that you're older. Now, I do remember that I finally, when I finally, the boy that I grew up with, me and him was good, boy, good buddies. And uh, we grew up together. In fact, we graduated together. And I can remember, I uh, think, that the first time that I ever remembered him really uh, realizing that I was, I was different than he was. And that's when we were in high school. And uh, he went off and he, you know, he uh, started dating his white girls and things like that. And uh, I was left out of the picture. And I never, ever really uh, thought about it because during the summer we was, you know, we was as close as two peas in a pod. We did everything together. I remember one time it, when we was growing up and all the boys had gone to the military and, and me and him was the only two boys that was left in Porter. And uh, you had a tradition that when Halloween would come, you know, you turn toilets over. I don't know whether you, you probably being a city girl, you don't probably know anything about that. But rule, that's one thing that we did. You know, you Halloween and you turned over toilets. And I remember we made a pact with us. We wasn't nobody there but us. And we said we was going to keep the tradition going. So we turned over 13 toilets by ourselves. And, <laughs> and uh, that was just some of the things that we did, you know, as, as uh, country boys and going up in the, in the community. But I really don't remember any, any racial any racial things that actually happened in my life growing up. Now, when I actually really come to the conclusion of what segregation was and what uh, uh, being separate was, was when we graduated from high school. Uh, uh, in my yearbook, uh, another good friend of mine, that we were good friends in high school, uh, they said that when we always put in who you're going to you know, what you're going to be and how the future is going to look. And he said, they said that he was going to own a chain of restaurants and I was going to be the head cook. So, uh, and I made up my mind right then, I'll never wash a pot and pan or I'll never wash in a, work in a kitchen. And I never have as far as that concerned. But still on the other side of the coin, another story is that when we, at that time, we always took a trip to Washington, D.C., the senior class. And I was the only black boy that graduated in my, in my class, and there were some girls in my class, but I was the only black boy. And we got on the bus and uh, left from uh, the Bidwell area, as you might say. And uh, early in the morning, drove to Maryland, stopped at the bus stop, got off, and the first thing that I seen when I got off the bus was white, black restaurant. I'd never ever experienced it, never even heard of it, never thought about it. And what it did for me was that being the only black boy that got off, it made me feel just about that high. It let me know right then that I was different than everybody else and that I had a long, hard road to hoe as far as uh, my race was concerned. But up until that point, I never really realized that I was any different than anybody else. Now, could you stay at the same hotel? We, yeah, we stayed at the Annapolis Hotel in Washington, D.C., but uh, just at the bus stops, you know. And, and of course, we was uh, together with the school groups, you know, they couldn't hardly get you down there and separate you, but, uh, but we got to D.C., and we as a group, you know, we went and saw all the, all the went to the, to the uh, Smithsonian Institute and all the, seen all the sites in D.C. and stayed at the same hotel. In fact, me and the, the, the good friend of mine, that, uh, uh, we stayed in the same, or well, the three of us did, the one that I grew up with in Porter and the one that was a good friend of mine in school. We all stayed, three stayed in, this, in the same room together. But uh, no, I, uh, I, uh, we never had any problem other than just the bus stops. And I don't remember whether I used the restroom or not. I don't remember. I really, in fact, I don't imagine I did. But I don't remember that. I just remember seeing the sign as we got off, the, the signs on the doors and colored in the white. So you were able to eat at the restaurants with them? Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. In D.C., you know, we're no problem in D.C. But, uh, uh, of course, we never stopped at any restaurants in Maryland or, in, you know, or things like that. But uh, uh, just there is the only thing that i really ever seen. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what year did you graduate from? 1958. And how many colored people were there in your class? Uh, uh, it was, of course, me, which was the only boy, and they were one, two, three, four girls. And what did you do after graduating from high school? Well, the first job that I did, uh, you see, my dad worked on a sawmill, and uh, that was hard, man. That was, of course, my father, and I'll have to explain to him a little bit about him. My father wouldn't take an easy job. Uh, sweeping floors and mopping and dish, he, 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 he wouldn't do that. Uh, I remember back during uh, World War II, uh, uh, a lot of the men that didn't go to, to the war, they would go to places like Vandalia and they made uh, uh, parts for airplanes and things like that, you know. And the only job that uh, the, the black man could get was cleaning up after the, 
after the whites did their job. In other words, sweeping up, cleaning up. Well, Daddy didn't last very long up there because he didn't he didn't go in for sweeping. He come back home and and uh, and he went to work on a sawmill. Then after I got out of school in 1958, he said, you know, there's not much to do here other than working on a farm. I went to work on a sawmill. And uh, uh, I don't know what you, whether you know about a sawmill, but anyway, uh, it it's saws logs. You saw lumber, just like lumber here. You know, you saw uh, one befores, two befores, two baits, two befores, whatever, you know, that you can get out of a log. In other words, they saw big logs. So you got a saw that stands probably uh, three and a half, four foot in diameter. And I was 18 years old, and I went to work for this man on a sawmill. And my job was what to call an off bear. Everything was manual, you know, it was all manual labor. And uh, you had the man that, uh, that did the, the sawyer. He stood behind, he had a lever. And uh, the log rolled over, he pulled a lever, and it went through the saw, it cut the slab off, which was the outside bark of the tree. Well, it would come back, when that would come back, the slab, which to the outside of the tree would come back. The man that was the off bear had to get the slab, and he had to carry it as far as some up to there and drop it and pile it up. When he come back, uh, he'd have the log turned and he was another slab waiting. In other words, it was just a constant run. Daddy heard him say many times that uh, at uh, uh, the first trip, he smoked a pipe, he'd put the pipe in his mouth. The next time, he'd put the back in the pipe and the next time he'd light it. In other words, it was just that, just that way. In other words, you know, like I was gonna tell you about me, I went to work on this sawmill and, uh, and it was just a dead run. You know, you, you off bared, you carried the slabs and you stacked the lumber and then, uh, and if you had any spare times, you got under the saw and shoveled the sawdust. Well, this man that I was working for, just me and him, he could, his log was big and he couldn't turn it. So the log would go through on a trolley and the saw was here and the log was here. Well, when I went through the saw to go help him turn the log, I went through it all right. But when I come back, when I come back, well, I drug my hand through it and that's where I lost that finger. And the, the ironic thing about that is that when I cut that finger off, that it never skint, never touched any of these fingers. We just hit that saw just right and just took that finger off to right there. And, uh, and the thing of it was that a little while after that, that I had mine done, that there was a man, another man, he was a white man who was working on a sawmill, and he went to go by it, and he tripped and fell in the saw, and it just cut him open. But I used to think about that and think about, you know, just how close that was, because when, you know, the saw stood that high, and when I went through it, I was, you know, running, you know, going, and I just drug my hand through it, but I could have put the whole thing, or a piece of clothing could have got into it, it could have jerked me into it, and, uh, and did it. But that's just some of the things that we did. Uh, Daddy worked on the sawmill for, I'd say, for, for 30 years. In fact, like I said, it was hard work. It was it was hard, brutal work. He was ruptured on both sides, and uh, uh, he'd have to lay down in the morning to to get his ruptures to go back in to to go to work. He wasn't he wasn't hernias. Yeah, how many hernias? What it was? Your your well, I was using the term. But your your in your intestines come out. You you lift so hard that it would tear your your lining of your stomach and your intestines would come out. Well, they'd come out, and if you didn't put them back, well, they'd swell out, see, and then you, but he'd have to lay down in the morning, and he, what you, had, you wore a thing, what you called a truss. It was a thing that had uh, uh, a big rubber ball on it, and he'd go against that, and it would shove it and hold it in. Well, he'd have to lay down in the morning to get them to go back in to go. He was ruptured on both sides, and he worked that way for 20 years. And he really didn't get operated on and get them taken off until after he retired at 60 some years old. But it was hard, brutal work. And like I said, that's what daddy liked. He wouldn't take an easy job. And I remember another job that me and him worked together on. Uh, we had a job working for a guy and he was uh, picking corn. Now you had a corn picker, pulled behind a tractor, goes in a big wagon, runs on four wheel. Then you, me and daddy would be at the, the corn crib and they'd bring it in. They'd unhook a wagon and we'd shovel it in. Well. Me and him, he wouldn't let me outwork him and I wouldn't let him outwork me. And, and we, uh, when they would bring another wagon in with that corn picker and the, tractor and the wagon, we'd be sitting there waiting for him to, for another load to come in. And we worked so good and so fast and hard that when the man, he was tighter in the bark on a tree. And when he got through that evening, and when we got through that evening, that he was, a, he was a, a, you know, pretty good, I got washed his money. And he was so well pleased with our work that we did that he give us extra money for doing that but uh, that's just uh, everything back when I grew up was hard uh, you know as far as working there wasn't anything as plants or anything like that that uh, and then another thing too that uh, people in our area especially in rural communities not only my dad but other parents too uh, you only got jobs that nobody else wanted uh, I remember a fellow over to Bidwell over he had a got hurt in the mine he had a stiff leg 
and his job was to go around and clean that outside toilets. You know, just just menial tasks that nobody else wanted. That uh, that's what you got. But uh, uh, but we didn't know any better. You know, we didn't. Everybody was in the same boat, white and black. Nobody at that time had a whole lot. Nobody had a lot of money, and uh, we all just you know survived on what we had. And like I said, as far as food go, now not like my wife. Now we we raised a lot of our food. We raised hogs, and we didn't raise beef, but we raised hogs. We raised garden. Picked every berry there was in in a ten mile radius. My mother, uh, uh, I don't know how they did it. My mother, uh, uh, well, to make a long story short, I told you my sister was 11 years older than I was. She took a picture in 11th grade with a shirt on. Now she was a girl and I was a boy. I've got the same, I took a picture when I was in the second grade with the same shirt on. <laughs> what my mother did, she took the shirt after my sister got through and she cut it down to where I could wear it. My mother could take a needle and thread and make anything. In her spare time, she would sew and make clothes, dresses. Uh, uh, we never made any pants or anything like that, but shirts. And in her spare time, she would keep, she never threw away anything. She'd keep the, the rags that she didn't uh, use for patches or anything like that or making things with. And she, I've seen her braid a, a, a nine by 10 rug. Uh, well, it wasn't braided, but however they did it together uh, to put on the floor. And I don't know how they did it. Now I can, I heard my wife said that they had electric. I can remember when they threw the creosote pole off in our yard. I can remember having a, a lamp light. After I went to school, we went to school and, and in 19, or oh, probably in 47 or 48, they finally come and put electric in the house, but we didn't have electric. And I can remember sitting there, you had a battery radio that we listened to and uh, we had uh, uh, things like that. And one of the great things that we listened to was Grand Ole Opry. You know, everybody, white or black, everybody was, was country. You know, we listened to all of those old country singers and all of them. We sung country western song, run country western, we sung country song. And uh, had another show that probably you've heard say was Randy's Record Shop. You've heard of that. Gallatin, Tennessee, you know, and that's, that's another that we listened to. The old battery radio you turn on and it would uh, uh, fade out, you know, and you'd have to sit right up close to it, you know, and listen to it and you listen to the fights, Joe Lewis and all those come along, great fighters back at that time. And really, you know, you, you, we didn't have much, but uh, you were satisfied with what you had. And like I said, I've seen my mother, like I said, I was telling you about her, uh, make rugs and things of that and have, and it seemed like they had time to do things. And we picked berries, I know that there's only uh, uh, four of us in the family, but we'd pick enough berries that when uh, winter would come, we'd have as high as 150, 200 quarts of berries under the bed. We'd start picking uh, raspberries, dewberries, and blackberries. And we'd pick clear to the through till there wasn't another uh, berry to pick. She canned every apple, dried apples, I don't know whether you've ever heard of dried apples, dried apples, uh, uh, greens, she knew every green that there was, that there was, you know, uh, raised a garden, uh, potatoes, we'd take them out in, the, out in there and, and put them in a big hill and leave them outside. We had a smokehouse, we killed two big hogs, we'd send to uh, Tennessee or Nashville and they'd get little chickens, they'd come through the mail and you'd get your chickens through the mail, you'd raise them up, you had your chickens on, uh, on uh, on Sunday. You never had chicken any other time, but on Sunday, you never got tired of it. Everything always tastes good. And uh, another thing too, that with my mother, I didn't like a whole lot of different foods, uh, vegetables and things like that in the garden. Uh, about the only kind of potatoes I liked was fried. Uh, cabbage and green beans and things. I didn't like that stuff, but I liked dried beans. And she, whenever we'd finish a, a pot of beans, she'd put another body of beans on. I could eat beans three times a day. I just wear well. But anyway, and what fried meat. Huh? What kind of beans? White beans, white beans. We eat various soup beans, what we used to call them, little white soup beans. We didn't eat too much of the other. But uh, fried pork, we eat that every day. Get up, she'd get up in the morning and like I said, Daddy worked hard. He'd go to work on, 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 the, on the sawmill. He'd leave probably 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And I don't remember ever getting up, going to school, uh, of not having a full breakfast on the table. Did it with wood, wood, not coal, wood. Daddy didn't have chainsaws back that time. Daddy chopped enough wood to keep the, the, the cook stove going and the heating stove going and besides going to work. And she'd get up every morning. We'd have biscuits, uh, uh, baked every morning, uh, fried potatoes, uh, what we call Joel bacon. It wasn't sliced bacon like we had now, but Joel bacon and uh, just a full meal on the table, you know, and, and every morning, three meals a day. And plus had time to do all the other things. She took care of the garden, the chickens, and picked the berries and the greens and everything else. And I don't know how they did it. We don't have time to do anything, you know, but then we got all the modern convenience to do it. But they did, I don't know how they did it. 
but it was just a just a way of life and way of doing things. And and like I said, everything tastes good. It, you know, it, you enjoyed eating because you never got too much of anything. I can remember my mother used to bake, and she she baked pies and cakes, and she'd make donuts and all them kind of thing. And uh, I used to, my pie was apple. And, uh, and that's one great thing about having a small family. When she'd make an apple pie, she'd make an apple pie for me, and I'd have an apple pie for myself. But that's just some of the little things that she did growing up. What were your chores? If your mom was doing all this and your dad was doing all that, what kind of chores did you have growing up? Well, <laughs> uh, mowing the grass, mowing the lawn, uh, oh, uh, taking care of the chickens and things like that. Uh, wouldn't let me chop too much wood because that was kind of, yes. yeah. Franklin. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, wherever. Okay. Cool. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the chores you had growing up. Basically, like I said, uh, I uh, picking berries was the, the job I despised. Uh, I never did like to pick greens. Of course, like I said, my mother knew every kind of green it was. I never did really get into that. But, but after she got older, then uh, especially along the roads, road like this, gravel road. Uh, there was a lot of wild lettuce, and there was what you call mouse's ear, naradoc, and all that kind of greens, and I knew them. But there was a hundred other different kind of greens that she used to pick, and I used to just despise to do it. And like I said, with berries, now especially days like this, it's hot, you know, and muggy, well, you'd have to get up way before daylight, and then you'd have to maybe walk for a half, three-quarter of a mile back in the field and pick berries. You'd pick berries and uh, and do what you call, well, like that bucket over a big... Uh, three or four gallon water bucket full or all that you could get. Then uh, you'd pick them berries and try to get, you know, out of the field before it got too miserably hot. And uh, that was things that I didn't like. Now, Daddy never did do that because he worked out, but usually the, you know, the children and the, the wife or the mother had, to, had that joy to do. But still, after you got back, now she still had to clean them berries and she had to, had to get ready and prepare them and can them and, and put them in the jar. And, and I, I don't, still to this day, I grew up in that time, but I just can't comprehend that how they did all the work that they did with what they had to work with. I just, and like I said, you know, and, and still had time to, to sit down and, and do other things when evening time. Of course, like I said, you know, we didn't have it before television come, you had the radio, but you know, you was usually in bed by, by nine or 10 o'clock, you know. And uh, I just, I just never could understand. Of course, you know, the day started early, but I just never could understand how they did it. But life wasn't, you know, really that hard. Now, after I grew up and went out and went to work and started working on farms and things like that, you know, but uh, around home, it wasn't that really that much to do, especially living in a little village, you know. Like I said, the biggest thing that you had was your garden and uh, you had your chickens and plus you had your lawn and things like that to take care of, but really there wasn't that much to do. In fact, growing up, after you got all that done, our boys that uh, I grew up with, our, our daily chore was to play. And we did everything, like I said, we'd, uh, uh, go swimming and we'd go out and we'd build log cabins and uh, steal chickens and <laughs> and I tell I tell my grandkids we I never I never eat uh, 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 frog legs you know you can buy a frog leg well the way we did it and we've heard about heard people ain't eating them you know we'd go out and we'd catch frogs just no matter what size he was and he'd probably be four or five of boys so some of them would say well I get the back leg back legs has got the meat on there's not really that much on them. Then you divide it up, some would get the front legs, and then somebody get the back, and all you had was the skin. And what we'd do, we'd build a far, and you'd take that little frog and stick him on a stick and hold him over that far. And really, the thing, whenever we'd get done, you just heat him up. But that's just, just some of the things that we did as boys. Did you eat them? Well, yeah, 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 we eat them, but, you know, I mean, heck, you, <laughs> but as kids, you know, that's, that's, that's what we did. But, you know, basically, they wasn't, uh, they wasn't really a lot of, you know, just six, seven, eight hours a day work. There was other things that we did. Um, what are some other uh, games or things you did for fun growing up? Well, I tell everybody, and, and, and the things really changed from my generation to my children's children's generation. Uh, I played basically the same games that my father played. You know, we, we shot marbles, we played, uh, uh, we had a game we called Roly Hole. I don't know whether you ever heard of that or not. But anyway, what you do, you'd have a bear yard and it'd be relative smooth and you'd what you do is kind of like playing croquet only you did it with a marble and uh, you'd, you'd bore, put holes in the ground and you'd take your marbles and shoot into that hole then you'd go around it and come back and then when you got back to the to the where you started from then you had uh, 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 was able to shoot other marbles and keep what you got 
but you had different, just kind of like croquet. <laughs> and you'd go around and you had to get in them holes before you did it. And uh, like I said, we played marbles and uh, uh, ball and uh, things of that, that nature, you know. And uh, uh, mostly we, as boys, we spent the biggest of our time back in the woods and things like that, you know. At, before we got to be teenager, you know, young kids. It's a wonder some of us hadn't got drowned, but we, you know, ponds, you know, we'd go swimming in ponds and things like that. And some of them would be 12, 16, 20 foot deep, you know, but uh, we was all, we was fortunate never so we got drowned. Um, how about going to the movies? After I got to be a teenager, uh, me and another boy, he'd, uh, uh, we'd, well, of course, we didn't have cars. What we'd do, we'd hitchhike to Galpolis, you know, you'd go out there and you'd hitchhike in there and you'd go to the Saturday matinee go down and as my wife said you'd watch all of the old cowboys you know and things like that then right next door uh, they had well I guess you'd call it a well we call them a beer joint but it was a tavern and you go in there and it was Eddie's place of course in Galpolis it's all burnt down now and what he'd have he'd have you go in and buy a hot dog you get a hot dog for eight cents and you put mustard on it, not sauce but mustard on it and you get a bottle of orange pop. Man, that was some of the best things. I believe I could eat a dozen of them things. But it was just, you know, just something that you didn't get a whole lot of and everything, like I said, just, just tastes good. And that's what we did on Saturday. And uh, I don't remember what the movie, probably the movie was, you know, 15, 20 cent maybe, I don't know. But it didn't take much money. But of course, another thing too that you have to realize back in the, in the 50s, and of course that's when that was, after we got to be that age, was uh, money wasn't that plentiful. Uh, I remember an older friend of mine, he lives up in Jackson County, and he's probably, he's in his 70s at this time, but he says he can remember of having a bottle of pop all by himself that he could drink it. Down around Porter with a bunch of us boys, if you'd get a bottle of pop and open it up, it'd be just like a bunch of wine nose. You'd have to pass that thing around and, and give it to everybody because, you know, pop was a nickel, but you didn't get, you didn't, you didn't get that many nickels, and it was just a, uh, it was just a luxury that uh, you never, and I notice my kids today, I've got keep pop out there in the refrigerator and, and we got pop out there in the garage and they'll get a can and open it up and set it around. Back when I was growing up, you didn't do that because, you know, it was a luxury. It's something that, uh, that you just never got enough of. Um, how would you get them money to go to the movies? Well, we'd work. Like I said, I'd, I'd mow grass for people. And of course, the guy that me and him usually went to, and he usually financed mine because he worked, he stayed with a guy, worked on a man's farm, and he had a, had a job. But, uh, but usually, you know, there was odd jobs that you could do. Uh, it was all hard, and like I said, just mowing grass. You had them old real type mowers. I know you've probably seen them. But uh, you'd let your grass get up too high, and man, it was a hard job, you know, especially if you're a little boy. And uh, and uh, they wouldn't let you cut the grass until it got up to where, you know, they thirty usually give you 25, 30 cents to cut it. And man, you did, you earned every dime of it. But like I said, you know, that's where you got your money. And you could, I remember uh, we'd go up the road, another guy raised tobacco. And uh, uh, we'd go up there and work all day setting out tobacco. And what you did, you took a, a, a wooden peg and sharpened the end of it. And you'd put it in the ground and put the tobacco plant in it and cover it up. Well, you know, you didn't, have sense enough to get a pair of gloves and your hands were soft anyway and man you'd wear a big blister in your hands and and you'd give you 50 cents you made 50 cents for working up there all day setting out tobacco and i can remember one time in in in, <laughs> in, the, in pacific that me and another boy one of her cousins we went up and set out tobacco and that's when they had a, the old station down there before it burnt down and like i said at that time you could take 50 cents and you could eat pop and candy on it for two days and uh, I come down there and was playing out there on the, on the swing out back of that filling station and I lost my 50 cent. <laughs> and I always swore up and down that he, that he found my 50 cent. He swore he didn't, but I, I, but I never got to spend my 50 cent. But, but, I, he, <laughs> but I think it bird stole my, he didn't steal it, he, I lost it and he found it and he never gave it back to me. But that's just some of the things that we used to do growing up. And like I said, it was, it was, a, it was a good time, it was a fun time. Now was the movie theater in Galpo segregated? Uh, not when I went in there. Not not when I. Now it may have been before. I don't remember some of the other guys talking about it. They had to set up in the balcony. But when I started going in there, then no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Now there were some restaurants in Galpolis that were segregated. You know, because I never went to them. But some of the older people, you know, they they, they knew about it and had some problems with them. But I never did. I never did have anything like that. How about roller skating? Did you roller skate? No, I never did roller skating. Like I said, you know, until I got to be. 19, 20 years old, where you didn't have a car and you couldn't get to Galpolis every Saturday like that. But, but no, we didn't uh, didn't do too much roller skating. I never did learn how to roller skate. Now my kids did, you know, they they did, but I never did. Like I'd break my neck. 
<laughs> in fact, uh, we what we would do, now like I said in the wintertime, we had a hill that, uh, well, it wasn't as steep as that, but you, we had sleds, you know, and we'd sleigh ride all winter, build far, stay up riddle, 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And we had another part of the hill was about as steep as that and right there. And what we'd do, we'd pour water on it and it would be nothing but a sheet of ice and you'd skate down that hill. And man, there's one guy over there, of course, he was older than I was, he was coming back up it. And when he come up the hill, his feet come out and he come down and hit that ice on it and block both his eyes around that thing. But you know, back at that time, you know, the winters seems like it, uh, and you didn't get out of school from, from winter time. And snow, it starts snowing in November and snow would stay on the ground and up until March. And we'd sleigh ride all, all winter, you know, and we'd have a big time, like so, you know, go and build fires and, you know, and get up there and, and uh, sleigh ride off the hill. About fishing. Yeah, we went fishing, but we didn't fish too much because uh, I don't know they wouldn't. If we had to fish, this was the biggest creek that we could really come to. But we could go to the little creeks, you know, and catch a little fish about like that. And we we'd take them home and clean them. We'd eat every one we catch, you know. But uh, we never did too much really going for that fish. Now, after I got <clears throat> older to be a teenager, and I did a lot of hunting, but I never did do much fishing. What did you hunt for? Well, uh, rabbit, squirrel, deer, you know. Uh, Oh yeah, groundhog. Yeah, I, I remember another <laughs> talking about a groundhog. We used to, you know, what a groundhog is. Well, anyway, a groundhog is, is I think, is uh, has got more of the wild taste than any other game that you can get. Rabbits are pretty good, and squirrel, you don't get the wild gamey taste. But a groundhog, especially he's an old one, he gets a strong gamey taste. Well, we got uh, the idea that you get a young groundhog and you put him on a grill and you barbecue him. You know, just like you would anything else. And you put it, you barbecue him, and it don't taste like a groundhog. Well, I brought one home, and I told my wife, you know, to, to barbecue him. Now, instead of her cutting the thing up, she just left it whole, put it in there, and barbecued that groundhog, and put it, and I couldn't eat that thing. <laughs> or just put him out there in her leg, you know. And I, that broke me eating the ground, eating the barbecued groundhog. But, uh, but uh, we did. Uh, now I do. Now, now she won't. Now she won't eat. Uh, her dad did a lot of hunting, and that's what they a lot of their meat was. That, uh, but. Uh, but I did, I'll, I'll eat everything. My kids won't either. Uh, very few of my children will eat wild meat. In fact, uh, I used to raise hogs after we come here. Now my children, they, won't, they wouldn't eat the hogs that I raised here. Down where we used to live, I raised a hog and I'd get a beef off the guy that I worked. Now my son would go up to his house and we'd butcher the hogs and the beef at the same time. He'd eat his, but he wouldn't eat mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, but uh, I, do, I, I used to, I, in fact, when we was growing up, in the wintertime, that's the way that uh, my dad and my family, that's the way they supplemented the meat was through, through hunting, you know, rabbits and things like that. And my mother, she would, you'd get, you know, go out and get a lot of rabbits, which she'd can them. I don't know if you've ever heard of a canned rabbit. Of course, you call it cold packing them. Uh, we'd take them and hang them out in the smokehouse. you call dry rabbits, you know, and then, uh, but uh, it was good. You know, it tasted a whole lot different that way, and it would just get one and kill them. Am I boring you to death? No, no, it's really interesting. I really like it. You give me lots of information. Um, just um, can you tell me um, what church did you attend growing up? I never really got into church until I was 35, uh, pretty much after my youngest daughter was born, uh, up in the 30s. Now, my wife, she was church-oriented, but I never, as another thing about growing up in Porter, we didn't, uh, we didn't, do much too much church we go around churches when special days was going on just for the the girls and things like that but as far as going inside we we didn't do it and i never really got started into church until i was around 30 some years old um can you talk a little bit about the church associated with the lambert lands uh in what way like what you know about the church what was its name what denomination it was in, in morgan yeah well, it was Morgan Bethel, and like I told you before, it was uh, it was uh, uh, founded in 1845. And as any little community goes, and back at that time, after my family came and after the ones was already in the area, there was at one time 26 families that lived in, in the area. And everything revolved around the church, you know, uh, whether you belonged to the church or whether you didn't belong to the church, everything within the community revolved around the church. Uh, the functions, they used to what they have, they called union meetings, they'd have anniversaries, and uh, they would have revivals, and, and when those things would happen, that usually that was the only, the only thing that was going on within the community, and that's where everybody come to. I can remember going to Morgan Bethel, and it wasn't that many, a very good place for people to park, and there would be cars that would be lined on both sides of the road for a half a mile in each direction. 
But now you can go to church and we've got all kinds of different uh, ways of going and all kinds of methods of getting there. And you can find a place to park anywhere you want to. But that, at that time, everything revolved around the church. And uh, whether you, like I said, whether you were in the church or whether you weren't, they had, a lot of times there'd be more people on the outside of the church than they would be on the inside of the church. Hot, man, they have all the windows up in there and, and uh, they seem to be having a good time. But, uh, but that's just the way that uh, things were done back at that time. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your grandfather and the process of people getting kicked out of the church? Oh, <laughs> no, I, I, like I told you before, my grandfather's name was Isham. And I don't know what Isham did, but if the old minutes that we have that we got a lot of our information from, that from the old, uh, older generation, that uh, within the minutes of Morgan Bethel Church, that for some unknown reason, they, they uh, kicked him out of the church. And whatever it was, we'd, the old minutes that we had and, and with the minutes that we had went back to 1840s and 1850s and growing up into the 1860s. And uh, we never ever seen where he ever come back. Uh, I don't know whether what he did, but I know some of the uh, ones up there that went, now some of them, they made uh, bootleg whiskey and sold it and they had uh, things like that. And those were some of the things that they put you out for. Now what he did, I don't know. But uh, my grandfather, my grandfather, he was, wasn't an ordained minister, but he was a lay minister. A lot of the preachers that were in the area that they were lay ministers. And a lot of them, I don't know whether they were, <laughs> were or not, because they were just about into just about everything you could think of. Um, can you talk a little bit about, did your parent? you said you didn't have a car, but did your parents own a car? Oh, yeah, yeah, daddy. Dad, in fact, in fact, my dad, and like I said, he, Daddy was born in 1903, and he was born in, in, in what we call Morgan, where Lambert lands. And uh, his mother and father uh, were pretty prosperous people. They owned, at one time, 60 acres right up the road up here, and then they owned other places in and around Lambert land. And when my dad turned, he always said when he got to be grown, he's going to move out. And he remember him saying one time, said when he turned, I think it was 18, said, man, he was, born, he was born in March 26, you know, and that time, you know, it was still snowing hard in March. Said he was laying upstairs, you know, under the big old heavy quilts and warm, and so he can remember his mother coming up and telling him, Doc, you know, you're 18 now, well, it's time for you to go. And he was the first man to own a car in, in Morgan. Uh, he got the car, he worked for a guy by the name of Ray Grover, and uh, he usually kept a lot of the people going in this area uh, with jobs and what have you. And he worked for him, and he got the car before he learned how to drive it. And he bought the car off of him, and he'd bring him home in his car, and he'd take him back, and he finally learned how to drive it, and he finally got it. But he was the first man to own a car in Morgan. And do you know what type of car he owned? Not back at that time, but back at that time, they had a lot of cars that we didn't have today. They had what they call the old Overlands, and I've heard him talk about them, and I've heard him talking about uh, uh, oh, I don't know, what are some of the Model A's and Model T's. I can remember, so I don't remember having a Model T, but I can remember when I grew up of having a Model A and riding in the rumble seat and things like that. But Daddy always had a, he always had a car. Never could drive too good, but he always had a car. I remember one time when he moved back down in where I told you where my mother come from, they lived up on a big hill and uh, the house set up there and then uh, down below it they had uh, what they had the coal house, I guess you'd say it. So Doc said, Daddy never could drive too good. You know, nobody could back at that age, you know, old man. He got up there and he got out of the car. And when he got out of it, he got to, to either set the brake or put it in gear. So the car went over the hill. <laughs> Instead of him getting in the car and putting on the brake, he was behind it trying to hold it back. And it went down and tore that coal house down. And <laughs> but uh, just some of the things. That, then another time they'd, they'd get together and him and another family, my, my, uh, my mother's uh, uh, niece, and her husband, they'd go out, you know, and of course my mother, she was the type of person that like I said, had suppers and things like that. My mother could play a, a organ, piano, a guitar, mandolin, banjo, she could play all that kind of stuff. And anyway, this particular time, daddy had the car and my niece and her, or her niece and her husband was with them and they was going around to different trees. They was picking up walnuts and hickory nuts, how they used to do, you know, going along the road. So this, uh, her, uh, his niece's husband was a little short guy. He wasn't very big and he had what you, running boards on a car, if you can remember seeing or hearing about that. So he just thought, well, he'd, he'd uh, instead of him getting in the car, just going from one tree to the next, he'd just get on the running board and ride on the car. Well, when he got in, uh, it was a four-door car, 
And uh, when he got in, he just jumped up there and put his hand on the post. And when he jumped up and put his hand on his post, his wife jumped in and slammed the door. <laughs> so she slammed the door on his hand. He was, he was short. And his feet come off the running board, and he wasn't, he wasn't, his legs weren't long enough to hit the ground. And he was trying to get her to open up a door, and he was down there swinging in the door and her to get it open. And I guess pretty comical thing. It wasn't too comical for him because it almost cut his fingers off. But anyway, Daddy, he, Daddy always had automobiles as far as I can remember clear up until he got too old to drive. Mm -hmm. Now, you just mentioned your mom playing um, several music mm -hmm. instruments. Mm -hmm. Do you play any? I can't play anything. I've, I've got banjos. I've got one right in there right now. It's brand new. I've got an organ sitting in there every time I think. And I've tried everything, and I've been trying to get my wife every time I think she'll buy it. I've been trying to get her to get me a saxophone. I think I'll try that next. I've got, uh, I've had banjos and guitars and uh, pianos and organs, and I can't play anything. I think, I think I could if I would just, you know, but I'd, I've, I can pick out a tune on it, but other than that, I can't. Now, one thing about my mother's side of the family, and every one of that family can play. Uh, her, all her brothers, and usually uh, the ones that grew up in the family, which would have been her uh, nephews, every one of them can play a guitar and everything because that's what, you know, they did. But uh, I never did. I never learned. Daddy, Daddy never could play anything. In fact, Daddy, I never did hear Daddy sing. Daddy done a lot of humming. <laughs> He'd hum, but I never did hear Daddy sing. But, uh, but that was just the difference in the different sides of the family. Now you mentioned Randy's record shop. Mm -hmm. What type of music was that? Well, uh, during the week they played uh, blues and jazz and things like that. But on the weekends they played gospel mu uh, music. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, that was other than Grand Ole Opry, that was about the only. Of course, now after I got up, uh, I started listening to other things, other things to listen to on the radio. Uh, Green Hornet. Uh, you had the. Uh, 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 Lone Ranger, uh, you had uh, all of them cowboy things that come on. I didn't have a TV guide, so I'd write them out and I knew exactly when they come on and where the number was and where I'd listen to them, you know. But uh, that's uh, basically what we did. And like I said, you, it, was, it was interesting. But uh, you had uh, uh, The Shadow. You probably don't know anything about them kind of thing. But anyway, they had all them kind of things on, on, the, on the radio and, and you had to use your imagination. I did a lot of reading. I uh, I had about uh, when I was grew up to be a teenager. I probably had 150, 200 comic books. You know, well, of course they were different than what they are now. They had, uh, you know, the westerns, and you had uh, Bugs Bunny and, and Porky Pig and uh, the Looney Tunes and all of them kind. You know, and it, funny books now. Well, you know, one funny book that they had it was kind of like they are now, and that was the, uh, uh, oh, oh. Uh, Oh, I can't think. Anyway, it went into the modern time where they had spaceships and all that kind of thing. I can't remember what it was. I never did care much about them. I always liked the, the animated cartoon. And we'd get them, you know, we'd, we'd uh, trade them, you know, to different people. And, and uh, I remember one time down in Porter where we lived, there was a maple tree sitting. I used to, summertime, I'd get up in that maple tree and sit up there and read up in that maple tree. So one day I was up there in summertime and I was sitting up there and I had me a good limb, you know, where you could lay in it, you know, and lean back. And I went to sleep. And I woke up and I forgot where I was. And I stepped out of that thing. And man, down through there I come. I just happened before I hit the ground, I grabbed a limb. But that thing skint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And that kind of put a brakes on me going up there reading in, the, in there. But I used to do a lot of reading. I used to read all of the dog stories. I liked dog stories when I was going to school. And didn't learn too much else, but I always liked to read things that were interesting to me. But that's, those are the things that you used to occupy your time, you know. And I think it, uh, uh, reading, you know, it, it, it helps you as far as, you know, as learning how other people is and things of that nature. Um, you mentioned working at the sawmill, mm -hmm. and what else did you do after that? You stopped working there. Well, like I said, farms, worked on farms, and then I went to work for, uh, uh, well, uh, a guy that had uh, uh, a wholesale uh, car dealership, and that's when we got married. That's where I worked in, and uh, uh, I was wasn't easy work either. We, 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 what it was, he had a quota. Uh, he had this 10 cars a week. And we'd buy our cars from up in your neck with Rikard Ford, you know, where Rikard Ford, he'd go up and get them. And back in the 50s and 60s, that's when they were bad about rust, you know, you, your rocker panels and all those things. Man, it was just sometimes with nothing but a pile of rust. And we'd bring them in and we'd fix them up and put them on the auction. And we had a quota of 10 cars a week. And you'd have to work a lot of overtime, especially on the auction was on a Tuesday. And on Monday, uh, you'd go to work on Monday uh, at uh, 8 o'clock, 
and uh, work till five. You come home and eat your supper. You go back seven o'clock. And I've seen the sun come up many a morning. You'd work all day and all night until you got the cars the auction. You'd get them up there about 1.30, 2 o'clock, and then you was off. But I did that for about 10 years. And then I, I left there, and I, I left him because it, uh, uh, finally I got to the place where I was making pretty good money from him. I got to be what you might call a working foreman. But uh, as I told him, and my wife finally got me to realize that there wasn't any future in it. You know, I had to do something, you know, that was going to, one of these days I was going to get old and I was going to have to retire. So I, uh, I went to work for the, for the state and, uh, and uh, things got easier then. Not physically because that's, that's where I got all this. I, uh, when I went to work, left and went to work uh, for the state, I weighed uh, right around 170 pounds. I never had an ounce of fat on me, but I went to work up there and, and just almost just, you know, stopped work from what I was used to doing. You know, I was used to working hard. and. Uh, almost drove me crazy because I was used to, you know, working hard and just suddenly just have to do that. But I got up there and, you know, and started eating them big meringue pies and things like that and just didn't, and, and the first time I can remember, I went up from 170 to 205 pounds, you know, just almost overnight. And it almost killed me. I got some, you know, I couldn't bend over and tie up my shoes and it's just miserable. But after that, I've, I've never been able to lose it. I never dreamed I'd ever have to worry about being, having excess weight because it was just something that, uh, we never had to be bothered. My dad lived to be 86 years old, and when he died, he never had an ounce of fat on him. He just, you know, worked hard all of his life, and and uh, and I do believe that, you know, that's what's a lot wrong with our generation today. We we eat all these different kinds of food, but we don't work them all. My parents, uh, neither one of them had heart trouble, or none of them had any high blood pressure. Never knew what it was, and I've seen my mother uh, fry pork, bacon, Joe bacon which was nothing but fat, and then eat the meat, and then take a biscuit and sop a grease out of the skillet. Never had high cholesterol, never had any of those things, but they worked, you know, and like I said, they've worked off the excess things that we do, where with us, you know, it, everything turns to fat. That's my, that's my theory.